our job tonight is uh, a pretty exciting one, and one that <laughs> weather be damned, we finally got to do tonight. And it is to celebrate uh, my friend and new colleague, Professor Zaria Navarro Aquino, and his uh, debut novel. And joining me today to celebrate, and uh, really for all of us to celebrate this book, uh, are my colleagues, Professor Mark Sanders and Professor Marisol Moreno, who are going to help introduce this book and welcome Xavier up here to the podium so we can hear something uh, from it. And before we get to those uh, big events, I of course want to acknowledge our presence here tonight on the traditional homelands of the native peoples, including the Haudenosaunee, Miami, Peoria, and the Pokegon Potawatomi, who have been using this land for education for hundreds of years and continue to do so. And in particular, if you haven't spent any time on the Pokegon uh, Potawatomi's website, there is so much to learn there about their culture, artwork, uh, pedagogy, means of teaching, culinary stuff. Well, it's a, an amazing website, and it's been a gift to spend time on it. So I welcome people to start there. And of course, I also want to thank uh, Kelly Hoof, Kelly Peed, uh, the folks from the bookstore, the folks from ND Studio, the folks uh, on the Zoom, hi Zooms, and uh, of course, the, the folks keeping the building open here tonight. All of them are making this evening possible. And uh, with no further ado, really, because lots of people have uh, smart and exciting things to say, and I am lucky enough to just be in the audience tonight and to really uh, celebrate being in the presence of uh, Xavier's prose and his vision. I'm going to sit down and I'm going to hand this podium over to my colleague, Professor Mark Sanders. Thank you. Good evening. I hope you all are doing well. Um, this is really a wonderful occasion, and I'm just very happy to be a part of it. Thank you, Joyelle, for inviting me to say something, and thank you, Joyelle, Creative Writing by Extension, uh, for putting this together. I am Mark Sanders, a uh, professor here in the English department, uh, and I am the director of the Initiative on Race and Resilience, and I'm going to say something uh, about that in just a moment. But before I do, I just wanted to, to say, kind of my, uh, give you a, a quick account of my first encounter with uh, Belorio. I was in my car in, a, um, in the parking lot of a 7-Eleven <laughs> waiting for my sons to come out with their breakfast, which was, <laughs> um, you know, Skittles and Airheads <laughs> for the most part. And so I turn on NPR and I hear this voice that I recognize but couldn't immediately identify. And this voice is talking about Herke Maria. And I said, oh, that's really interesting. And this voice talk, was talking about these characters who were trying to deal with the trauma, uh, both of their past as well as the hurricane itself. And it, just at that moment, my sons start piling in the car talking about Skittles. And I'm like, be quiet. This is my colleague. You Just listen. It turned out to be Xavier talking about Belario. If you haven't heard the interview, I really encourage you to go listen to it. I went to NPR to find it, and I couldn't find it. But if you go to Xavier's website, it's the first link that you, you encounter there. And so it's just a wonderful uh, context and, and a, a way to understand how he came to this project. And so as I'm listening and telling my sons to be quiet and listen to, it really hit me in a very palpable way why we did all this work why we wanted to be a part of art. That is, we, IRR, wanted to be a part of art that transforms, art that really matters. And so you might remember that it was just about this time last year that IRR and creative writing were coming to the conclusion of a search that we thought was going to yield us one artist, but actually yielded two, Dion Graymeyer, and Xavier, and so we're really overjoyed to have them both. And the reason why really starts to get at, it's so wonderful to see you, Mari Lynn. Nice to see you too, Mari. Thank you for coming. I'm sorry I'm late. Today. No, you're, I've said it before, Thanks you are out. never I'm late. Professor <laughs> <laughs> Fraga, great to see you as Good well. Good to see you. Thank you. But as I was saying, the why as to why IRR chose its first time out with the first opportunity to 
search why we wanted to partner with creative writing in English and to, and to bring an artist to campus, and it has everything to do with our larger project. Many of you all, you all have heard me say time and time again kind of the boilerplate of who we are. IRR is and strives to be a community of scholars and students and artists and activists all working to reinforce one another, to support one another in two ways. One in the confrontation of uh, systemic racism and two in the support of communities of color. We are global in scope. We think of ourselves as being both interdisciplinary and comparative in critical approach. And we see ourselves articulating this vision through three primary foci, through research, education, and community outreach. Now, you can read all of that on the website. I'm not telling you anything that you have to kind of assemble to listen to me to find out. But what you won't find so well articulated there is the centrality of the arts. Why it is that we want the arts featured in everything that we do. We want to understand the arts as a means of knitting together these three areas. The arts as research, as a way of knowing, a way of rationalizing our past, understanding the present situation that we all share, and in view, envisioning alternative futures. Education, understanding the arts as a means of education. And of course, in terms of community empowerment, understanding the arts and the ways in which Communities wield art as affirmation, as community building, and as a means of sustenance. And we also thought of the arts at a kind of theoretical level as the means by which we can hold together this impossibly conflicted concept of race. On the one hand, we understand race as clearly a tool of oppression and exploitation, but at the same time, race is a site of identity a means of self-affirmation, and therefore a means of resistance and resilience. And so how could we build a program that is fully alive to that immediate and ongoing tension? How can we hold those two warring impulses in, equally, in equal measure? Or perhaps how, uh, as uh, Ralph Ellison might put it, how can we finger that, that jagged grain? There's no better way than through the arts. And so being here today to celebrate Xavier's debut novel, Bellario, is the fullest expression of, of IRR's vision and aspirations. And so I just want to say thank you all for being here. Thank you for cre to creative writing for putting this together. And most of all, thank you, Xavier, for your art. <laughs> well, thank you everyone for being here. This is really exciting. Uh, we've been looking forward to this event for, uh, for quite a while. Uh, my name is Maricel Moreno. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Romance Languages and Literatures, um, where I teach um, Latino, Latina literature. Um, and also fellow at the Institute for Latino Studies. And others, I'm not gonna bore you with that. Um, so thank you, uh, Initiative for uh, on Race and Resilience and the Creative Writing Program for organizing this very important event. Um, it's really such an honor to introduce my, my colleague uh, um, and fellow Puerto Rican, Xavier Navarraquino. There's not too many of us on campus, so it's always really a <laughs> for celebration. Um, and, you know, he asked me to just limit it to like two minutes, but I'm sorry, I, I have to do a little bit over two minutes, uh, but I know we're here to listen to him, so I'm not going to take a long time to introduce you. So, Dr. Navarro Aquino uh, was born and raised in Puerto Rico, and if you've read Velorio, uh, you know that that experience is something that he vividly brings to the page. He holds an anime in English Caribbean Studies from the University of Puerto Rico and a PhD in English from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. <coughs> Dr. Navarro Aquino is an assistant professor of English and creative writing at Notre Dame, and one of two exciting recent hires, along with Dr. Uh, Diane Bremeyer, by Notre Dame's Initiative on Race and Resilience. 
His creative work has been featured in prominent literary magazines, including Tin House, Max Sweeney's Quarterly Concern, and Guernica, among others. He has been awarded scholarships from the Bread Loaf Writers Conference, the Sewanee Writers Conference, a McDowell Fellowship, and an American Council of Learned Societies Emerging Voices Fellowship at Dartmouth College. He is the author of Velorio, his debut novel, which was published in January by HarperCollins, and in Spanish by HarperCollins Español, an outstanding accomplishment for any emerging author, especially an emerging Puerto Rican author, given the lack of Boricua representation in mainstream U.S. presses. As one critic put it, Velorio conveys the heartbreak of Hurricane Maria for Puerto Rico. Reviewers have called it one hell of a debut novel. <laughs> and the New York Times referred to the author as an incredibly talented young writer. The Chicago Review of Books has said that Velorio is both a complex, politically engaged work and a deeply human story from a writer who's surely at the start of a long career. I'm realizing I'm still wearing my mask. I forgot to do it. <laughs> I'm so used to it. Okay. To this praise, I would add that for this reader, Velorio was equally thrilling and heartbreaking. In fact, it's a story that continues to haunt me. And I mean this in the most positive sense of the word. Hurricane Maria definitely marked the before and after for Puerto Ricans on the archipelago and in the diaspora. And in so many ways, we are still living with her today. Her memory is raw and alive. Velorio poignantly captures the afterlife of Hurricane Maria, la monstra, the monster. Reminding us of the blue tarps over blown roofs, the courses in refrigerated trailers, the interminable, interminable lines of people looking for gas and diesel, the collapse of the telecommunications system, the destruction of the power grid, the hunger and thirst, the suicide crisis that followed, and the estimated 4,645 dead. The novel takes issue with the complete failures of the local and federal governments to deal with the situation, showing, as geographer Neil Smith has suggested, that there's no such thing as a natural disaster, because natural causes are not entirely divorced from the social. Dr. Navarro Aquino masterfully weaves together the reality of being a colony confronting a major natural and social disaster, or what I like to call surviving while colonized, and the fiction of a dystopian future that hits a little too close to home. Camila, Bayfish, Banto, Moribibi, Cheo, Urayoan, Marisol, take us on their journeys as they seek to survive the disaster, forcing us to grapple with the complexity of the different layers of violence that they confront as they imagine a better future in the fictional town of Memoria. I'll leave you with this. Once, when asked what has been the best piece of writing advice he's ever received, the author said, if we don't tell our stories, someone else will tell them for us. Dr. Navarro Aquino is certainly a testament to the power of an authentic story, one that vibrantly examines and hones in on the intricacy of the human condition, and we are honored to have him here today. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Xavier Navarro Aquino. And if I speak of paradise, then I'm speaking of my grandmother who told me to carry it always on my person, concealed, so no one else would know but me. <clears throat> that way they can't steal it, she'd say. And if life puts you under pressure, trace its ridges in your pocket. Smell its piney scent on your handkerchief, hum its anthem under your breath. And if, you, if your stresses are sustained and daily, <clears throat> get yourself to an empty room, be it a hotel, hostel, or hovel. Find a lamp. 
and empty your paradise onto a desk. Your white sands, green hills, and fresh fish. Shine the lamp on it like the fresh hope of morning, and keep staring at it till you sleep. Uh, I forgot to inform you that that's, it's all downhill from here. That was <laughs> Roger Robinson's A Portable Paradise, and I think it's a fitting way um, to begin this short event um, regarding the novel Velodio. Um, I'm, I'm not much of a reader as far as like enjoying my own voice, so I'm going to try to keep this brief. Um, as, as far as that's concerned, the novel is told between six different alternating perspectives. Um, and my hope is that, uh, that I read from Moribibi, one of the protagonists, because I think that they're all sort of protagonists throughout the, the novel. Um, and if we have time, which I, I hope we will, and I think we will, as soon as I'm done talking, um, I'll read a short excerpt from one of the poets, or the poet of the book, who fancies himself a poet, the character named Chael, who writes poetry on the page for varying reasons. Um, if you read the book, you'll, you'll sort of uncover some of those, some of those intricacies. But without further ado, I'll begin with Moribibi. We saw people acting as birds fly today. It was, it was midday, but the sky was overcast, and it felt like late afternoon. Most days feel like late afternoon. After waiting at the Gulf for Diesel, Urayuan disappeared. We decided to look for food in the old city they used to call Atorre. We journeyed toward the Banco Popular and all the insurance skyscrapers once booming with life. This was before the calamity. The streets were now abandoned, and the office edifices had blown windows. There were white tents spread throughout La Milla de Oro. Palm trees and thin hedgerows that used to line the avenues were uprooted or left alone and grown wild. The fine art cinema with its grand entrance and escalator was looted and shards of broken glass littered the floor. There were no cars in all their multicolor, clogging the roads. The McDonald's and CVS no longer bustled with transit. The Burger King the same. We thought to stop in the corner on Roosevelt. The Maris had a friend who worked there restocking the produce and receiving groceries. But as we crossed Roosevelt, we saw nothing down the road, a quiet mess, and I knew it wasn't worth seeing a corner ransacked. I wanted to venture deeper into Atorre and check on some people we knew who lived in Floral Park, a small, tight cluster of rundown houses in the center of all the concrete and tall buildings. The Maris must have felt this. So she shook her head and insisted we keep pressing forward, closer to the center and to the people. We walked and walked, and if you stopped for a moment, you could hear the ghosts busy at work, those echoes left behind after so much noise, vibrations, and sound filled us both. <clears throat> ghosts of people occupied with their business jobs, ghosts of men dressed in sleek pants and tight dress shirts, many fat from eating too much fast food, Ghosts of women in office attire and the sharp click of high heels as they walked. If you stopped for a moment and closed your eyes, you could hear laughing or yelling. The humming of cars trembling idly at the stoplights steaming under the violent afternoon sun. We stopped to hear these ghosts because Damaris was tired and the memory must have been soothing to her. <clears throat> Amiya Dora was transformed into a shanty town surrounded by rows and rows of white tents, some with FEMA insignias, and that made Damaris angry. She still fumes about how the old government and FEMA dispersed emergency funds, such things as strange and foreign companies <clears throat> like Whitefish coming to our island, taking advantage of disaster, proclaiming a solution to the failed power grid. Emergency funds disappeared into unknown pockets. Proposals made to Amazon for the building of their second campus at Roosevelt Rosie Roads Naval Station were ignored, even after the Secretary of Commerce sold hard the idea of paradise. Instead, the old government kept those thousands of bottles of drinking water and aid at Rosie. And to this day, we're told the water and aid sit at Rosie, rotting away. We'd grown used to the constant misallocation of monies from the old government, where contracts were handed out, funds designated, then disappeared, while the proposed projects were never realized. We'd grown used to this 
And even though we raised our voices and growled, we remained static. Continued reports detailed the old government was conveniently misplacing and losing many trucks filled with more aid. At first, we thought it was all Urayuan. But after news broke that mayors and the governor were in on these disappearances, Urayuan started looking more and more like a solution rather than a problem. We grew tired of all the promises. We started thinking more about the Reds and Urayuan's new town or city or memoria, whatever it's called. It sounded more appealing as time went on. We continued with our hands linked Homeless or abandoned people camped on the floor or made lines into the white tents. Officials dressed in vests and hard hats gave out scraps for food. I was sick of the waiting. Places like Florencia and everything isolated and rural were neglected, and the Maris was crying more these days. The tents with their female insignias uh, signaled a false attempt that something was being done, but it made no difference to the Maris and me. I took my knife and carved into one of the tents. I cut around the word FEMA and ripped the black letters from the white tarp. I threw it on the ground and spat on it, and the Mahdi smiled for the first time in weeks. Her long, curly hair was disheveled, but her face, even stained and dirty, was beautiful. I wondered if it was time to find the reds and go to Memoria. We kept hearing popping echo in the air and could see afar something falling from the broken windows. So I stopped. One of those officers dressed in a vest and a hard hat. Why aren't you helping with the older people, I asked. I was angry. I held the Marisa's hand as I kept repeating this to the officer. Why isn't anyone doing anything to stop that noise? People throwing things from those windows. I pointed to the buildings above and the officer ignored it. If you want food, get in line like everyone else, the officer responded and pointed to the trail of people waiting to be fed. I grew impatient. So I tugged the Maris and we moved past them and kept walking. I didn't want us to stay there in that camp because everything felt lifeless. I feared that if I left the Maris there, she'd waste away in abandonment. The only means of finding memoria was through the Reds. They were spread throughout each major town and didn't always listen when you asked them questions. They had a reputation of running off like scared cats. Can we rest, Modi? Please, I'm tired, the Maris said. We need to keep moving just a little more. I don't want us to stay here. You'll get sick if you stay here. I'm tired, Mori. I know. We saw people acting as birds fall today. The Maris wasn't sure if they spread their wings evenly, but I knew they wanted to reach the sun. Pops like gunfire echoed in the long avenues, and the exposed metal frames from some of the empty buildings trembled. I covered the Maris' ears. I knew the people dressed as birds were failing to spread their wings evenly, and the Maris was so tired. Her eyes gray and dark from little sleep, her hands weak and fidgeting. As we walked through the camp, we wondered if this was the end, if this was how things would be from now on. Everything we grew up loving, now an afterthought. We remembered all the old songs playing on La Mega, the little money we had we'd spend shopping or pulling off from the heat in Plaza, getting dizzy and throwing up after riding La Caja de Muertos in La Feria, La Fiesta Patronales, El Festival de la Macarena Tillo, all of it. We waited in a dilapidated bus stop, hoping the old transport would appear and take us away, anywhere. Then we saw her, an old woman with short white hair. We saw her in the American International Plaza building. The building used to house UBS or AIG, or something of a sort, but now it wasted there with its blue windows blown and shattered. She was standing next to the edge of that exposed office. She must have worn a long white dress. I like to imagine her face, wrinkled with wisdom and anger and frustration. Her eyes heavy set and her skin botched with an uneven tan. Her thinning but full head of hair was platinum, cut just under her ears. She was angelic, the old woman. She carried herself to the ledge, and she looked so peaceful. The Maris noticed her and could only wave. Then I waved, and we were both down there below her, waving. Not an agitated or desperate hello, but something like mourning or remembrance. And the old woman waved back. She presented herself to the air, and she wanted to glide out into that openness. So she did. She let herself fall. And at first it seemed like she would never rise, but the Maris and I kept waving as she fell forward, and we saw her rise 
Her long and torn dress flickered and opened, and she fluttered over us like a pitifre. Isn't she beautiful? The Mahdi's family said. She held my hand as I hugged her. Yes. Yes. Okay, so this last portion I'll read is from the protagonist, Cheo, who fancies himself a poet, and so throughout the novel, as he's journeying to the, the supposed utopia of memoria, um, he's often writing notes and lists and poetry and drafts of poetry throughout the book. Um, and this is what I consider his last poem before, before the events continue in the book um, that he feels accomplished. And so I wanted mostly to introduce him because I haven't had a chance to read him in the events so far and all the events that I've had for the book. Um, and I think that um, he often gets lost in the conversation with, with all the other protagonists often trying to sort of allocate space and time. Um, our poor Cheo often is forgotten. <laughs> Leaving is a grieving. At least that is what I feel as I watch myself leave, until there is no island blocking the horizon. I remember Cristobal Colon, all that is taught of him, how we've elected to build statues and name that Plaza de Colon in Viejo San Juan. There, a concrete facsimile with a frozen gate, almost lifelike, grips an unfurled flag with a crucifix finial as crown. The patterns on rock tapestry, indistinguishable. But I know those patterns speak empire. Oh, a sort of cheap Christ the Redeemer. Oh, he must speak like Lazarus in Bethany. His stone gazes over the Atrotapia and its dark wooden patios, arched like many crescent moons, served as shut prisons to nowhere. Lord, I can't forget the other ugly copper replica, an obscene giant planted like a bruised thumb near the shores of Arecibo. I think of him, and I think of us, and it makes me weep. It's my father and leaders, old and new, that create the same phantom pains. Oh, occasions to cry, and I feel no shame. Are we culprits to their fate, and live by our names? And that is empire, and that is violence. Christ, this whole fucking island, I see it cry for connectivity. If we fell into survival, we clung to hope near cell phone towers like schools of fish wrapped around an orbit, climbing atop cars hoping to connect to something, trying to speak back to you. It wasn't just me. It wasn't just you trying to reach us. We tried to reach you too. We've already been grieving generations of desertion. I live now in a time of roses let go at sea, roses dropped and cradled in waves for the thousands of people past. I dream and drift on this sea, but it only leads me back to me, back to home. I live in the rose and in the sea, the currents drift in different patterns, no blue colors and foaming water reflections, no green tips speared out of calcerinas, no familiar horizon. It all looks as mud, a land banked by sand and sediment, even months after, even as Robles, Palo de Tamarindo, Guanabana, Eucalyptus, Flamboyan, Calabash, all try to inject green back into the line of the sun. I want Palo Viejo, or Bacardi now, rum that burns but soothes. And as I squint to look back just before a new storm stews ahead of me, I see my island. I see you there on those shores looking out to me. <clears throat> a stateless seaman, a mongrel, a mermaid, a shallow to drift in that expanse. I carry you as heavy as I carry home as heavy as this pen tries to mark onto paper all that I am, all my love. I know the salt and fish will eat this, but you may never read these lines. My head is cold and bare, my skin blistered the same. I'll see the roses you let fall into these waters as remembrance, as memory. Sing again, in mourning, in celebration, even if they remain stranded in the dark and deep I poke into these paper sheets, small acts of desperation, because I too sing Borican. I, Cheo, write lines in poetry. And that's it.
were asked to have a conversation, uh, right? <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not really sure if, if you're going to take questions from the audience at some point or not. Um, um, do we need to leave some time for that? I, I, I hope we can, yes. Um, yeah, yeah we'll, yeah, we'll leave about 10 or so after, but um, yeah. Immediately followed by everyone getting up and purchasing a book. <laughs> so just, just order that in your mind. On your yes, yes. Um, so I'd like to start, well, first, first of all, thank you for, for that reading and for um, shining a light on, on Cheo, too, which she, he's a very fascinating character, um, the poet, right? Um, before we maybe begin talking about some of the characters in the work, um, I'm thinking of, you know, I don't think it would be an exaggeration to say that most Puerto Ricans have like PTSD associated with Hurricane Maria, whether whether we're talking about people in the you know in the archipelago or or in the diaspora, so um, I'm wondering about that your decision you know can you talk about that decision to write about this very traumatic uh, moment of Puerto Rican history and and about your process in terms of navigating such a heavy subject? Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean. I, I think I've said this a few times, but I, I love repeating it because I, I think it's most true. Um, when 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 people hear this, they start to realize um, my resistance. So I didn't want to write about her, the hurricane immediately after. I there were a lot of a lot of artists, a lot of activists, a lot of scholars that found ways of having language um, after the hurricane uh, or a month or so and there were there were a few books published immediately after compilations of, of reflections and and reactions to the hurricane's aftermath um, but I just wasn't in that space I was able to return back to Puerto Rico um, back home shortly after the hurricane had just hit um, I always tell this this story because um, I was sitting with with my wife she's in the crowd uh, <laughs> um, we had this tiny little 200, 300 square foot apartment in Nebraska. I was in grad school. I'm doing my PhD. And as the hurricane was approaching, I had called my mother um, because I, I felt like I wanted to be there with her. Um, and she, she was staying with my brother. My brother was staying with her. They were staying in, in, in the house that I grew up. And she and my brother both, both, both said, um, you shouldn't come. Because we didn't plan. We didn't buy resources. We didn't allocate those funds for you to, to, to return. Um, so I, I sort of sat pat, I, 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 stood, I stood by and, and as the hurricane hit, as it went through, um, and as days started passing, um, like all Puerto Ricans um, abroad, they, there was no connection to home. Um, you couldn't reach uh, your loved ones, you couldn't find ways um, to, to, to figure out whether everyone was okay. Um, and so that, that had me worried. And I, and I guess I was living in a, in a fantasy thinking that if I managed to find a way back, um, I, could, I could help. <laughs> which, which, I, which I say is foolish because I didn't have any connection or certainty that I would be able to make it back um, to my house um, other than walking from the airport, which is, which is close if you're driving. It's about 30 minutes without traffic, which every Puerto Rican knows that's, that doesn't exist. Um, <laughs> traffic is always evident, especially in the metropolitan area. Um, but uh, I knew that I, I wanted to be there, so I, I, uh, as foolish as I was, I packed my bags, I, uh, a book bag with like bread and, and an empty canister of water. And when I, when I landed in Atlanta, I filled the water up and I was thinking all these silly things. I had made a reservation that didn't go through on my end, but I figured maybe it went through somewhere in the airport for a rental or something like that. Um, and, and when I arrived in the airport, I found it fascinating that the plane was filled with Boricuas and Puerto Ricans wanting to return and help in any way uh, possible. This was about five or six days after the hurricane. Um, but everyone that was trying to get on the airport, the airport was bar barely functioning. It was, it was just running on generators. Um, everyone that was trying to leave was white, and they were tourists. And they were trying to, to essentially escape while we had a bunch of uh, Boricuas trying to return to find and help and find any ways that they could um, help out. Um, so that was the initial impact that I saw when I saw those faces and the humidity of the, of the airport and sort of that claustrophobia. Um, but I ventured out, I, I, and the rental was there, surprisingly. They, they were running on a generator, and, and, and they had my, my reservation, which I found fascinating. Um, and so driving through that, that landscape really, really hit me. Um, and that stayed with me for a very long time. Arriving to my house and seeing everything destroyed and seeing trees and all the green and everything, that, that landscape, um, 
um, that we grew up loving, because Puerto Rico is very bri vibrant, the Caribbean is very vibrant, um, that was all gone, and that, that stayed with me for a long time. And I still remember my brother when he opened the door, um, my mother, my mother she, she, she got emotional, and then when we sort of settled in, my brother made a joke as he would always, he just said, you should have turned that hero music off in your head. Coming in, and that, I mean that's that's my brother's humor, I suppose. But um, <laughs> but 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 there were many. So I spent about a week and a half back home, just trying to trying to help out and trying to clean up the mess and clean up the yard, and and check on checking on my in laws who live in in Carraiso in Trujillo Alto, um, and that was towards the end of the trip. And some signal was very spotty, and so I was able to make communication to return. But I always felt that responsibility and and that that shock of seeing everything. Um, and so that stayed with me for a very long time, and it wasn't until 2019 where I actually began writing the book. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, what about the the genesis of of the story itself? Um, where there's, you know, um, I mean, you've talked about your experience going back, and so so quickly after the hurricane hit. Um, I was not able to go back for a few months. And, yeah, there were and even flights still, getting canceled every right. few, and so it was like lottery. You, you would book a flight, and then in a few minutes later, or the day next day, it would get canceled. Right. Um, but for whatever reason, my flight didn't, um, which was very surprising to me, so I just went through it. I always thought that by the time I reached Atlanta, yeah. I would be stranded in Atlanta. Again, foolish. This is really a foolish thing, because if you don't have a, a concrete plan, you're kind of working on desperation. <laughs> it's like disaster mode, you're like... Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> So yeah, thinking of the genesis of the actual story, you know, in, in the novel, which is really also many stories, mm -hmm. right, at the same time. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? I mean, obviously we know it's in the context of Hurricane Maria, but, but beyond that, were there any particular stories you heard or anything that inspired you or any of the characters? Yes, um, Camila, the, the character that opens up the, the novel, and she's in a long process of grieving, and it's a very graphic depiction of her um, trying to accept her sister's death, which she was encased in a mudslide. Um, and she's a 13-year-old, uh, 12, 13-year-old girl. I think that's what I have her age. I don't remember at this point. It's in there somewhere. She's 12 or 13. Um, and she's in, a, in, in absolute denial of, of that fact, of the fact that, um, that her sister has passed. And so she takes it upon herself to, to carry her, to carve her out of the room that she was encased in. Um, and, and walk her through, through, through town. Um, that, that was the genesis of the novel. I always like to say that's a genesis because there were many accounts um, that, that, that were being reported of, of people not being accounted for. And one of which was very graphic to me and striking was that there was a, a, a family of elderly sisters um, that they brought one of the sisters from, from, a, from a nursing home back home to ride out the storm and inadvertently a landslide had come and killed the, to a couple of the sisters. And that, that was the inception of, I had read that story probably a month or two after, and I couldn't leave that image out of my head. I couldn't get it out of my head. I kept thinking about like, what would it be to be living in the, in the house and no one coming to help out and you have someone in the next room encased um, with, with, with that tragedy. Um, and so I just started, when, when, I, when I went to my residency in McDowell, um, I had, I had very few options in McDowell. It's an artist residency in New Hampshire in the middle of nowhere. And you can either do things, you can just sit around, contemplate life, or you can get to work. And so I was working on another book, and that wasn't, there wasn't any steam on, on that side of that book, which I'm still working on today. So maybe I have to re rethink of that book in different ways. Um, but I, I do care about that book. Uh, but I, it was either continue to labor in a project that wasn't as fulfilling at the moment or try to invest in this story because I had said, if, I, if I'm going to write about this, if I'm going to have an account and, and reflect these ideas, um, it's going to be here or it's not going to happen. And so I just went in. I just went in and since that was all that I was doing, I said, I'm going to write it. And so I just did. I just wrote it. Um, and I was very surprised uh, that, that the story kind of fell out of me in the way that it did. I was thinking a lot about Lord of the Flies. I was thinking a lot about um, multiplicity of voices, uh, as I lay dying, um, particularly came to mind um, as far as a form that would guide me because I knew that I didn't want to write a book centered on one protagonist. I, w I wanted to write a book that had a collective um, memory of these experiences that they're all shared in that in that in that trauma. But in many ways, how do you how do you address that? Um, so 
that when, when these characters sort of formulated in the first day or two there, where I was just imagining this cast of characters, an interesting figure presented himself, and it was the what I like to say the antagonist, but a very unfair title to give to our dear Ura Yohan um, as an antagonist. Um, and I wanted this figure to represent um, the complete complexity of of the Caribbean experience, in particular, of course, in Puerto Rico, but beyond, right, the regional complexity of of colonialism and, and in most cases in the Caribbean, post-colonialism. And so I couldn't think of any other figure other than the Caliban figure, right? The Shakespeare's, the Tempest, the Caliban figure, in which as Walcott, Derek Walcott often has said um, before his passing, saying that Caliban carries the most interesting and beautiful language in the Tempest, often because he's reflecting on nature, he's reflecting on, on sort of the environment and its, and, its, and its unruliness in many ways. And so he holds a certain kinship to that and sort of the nativity of, of Caliban in that island. And so I thought about this character, Urayuan, and I wanted him to carry the most interesting language in the novel. Um, and the only way I felt I could achieve that is to sort of just imagine a ranting figure unleashed in his, all his capacity who can in many ways evoke instances of violence because the, the colonial condition and the post-colonial condition is inherently violent. And so I, I, I knew that that character would be charged with a lot of those responsibilities, but I felt very um, excited about the possibility of writing without no boundaries. And I mean that in its most literal way. I wasn't thinking about him structurally when I was writing through him as a protagonist. I wasn't thinking about him um, uh, in syntactically or grammatically. I wanted him to just be unleashed and just write, write, write. And when I had, had conversations with my editor about editing him, um, he was the most difficult to edit, most easy to write because I just wrote him um, in all its interesting ways and then she would be coming back and, and really pulling him apart and trying to just make sense of some of the things that he's saying. So I like to think that if readers get close and read him and slow down, because I've, I've been very surprised by how readers have been very hateful of him, which is fine. I mean, he, he does a lot of terrible things. but. When you read him, when you read him at the sentence level and the things that he's reflecting, he's reflecting a lot about language, he's reflecting a lot about, about the pain and the history of language, um, that, that, that those things are carried through in different ways. Um, so those characters, are, they're all sort of formulated and then I just went through and I did it and I was very surprised that it was coherent by the end of it. I, that was the most exciting thing, it was just like, wow, this makes sense. I, I, I don't know, <laughs> this is great. Yes, yes. Um, I, it, it's such a political novel, you know, it seems like, honestly, all of the characters are very much aware of uh, the colonial condition of Puerto Rico. There, there is such a, um, an important treatment of disaster capitalism mm -hmm. that runs through the work, too. Um, at the same time, so many references that I, I love that you don't expect Blade, right? Like you throw in references that uh, people who are familiar with Puerto Rico, you don't have to be Puerto Rico, but if you're familiar with the reality and, the, and its most recent history, you'll get a lot of the references, otherwise you won't. Uh, and I'm wondering, was that something that um, as you were writing, did, did it kind of hold you back? Like, do you feel like, you know, thinking of a wider mainstream U.S. audience, right? Mm -hmm. Who usually, I mean, I'm, I teach courses, and when I introduce Puerto Rico, my students always confess they don't know anything about it because it's not taught in school. So I, you know, you can assume that that's the situation for the general reader. So I just wonder how you dealt with that, or do you just not care? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think when I started writing early on in my, I, I, I always say that I started writing fiction in my early twenties and or my late teens. I, I fancied myself a poet. If you didn't recognize. Like I, I, I really had that ambition. And it's I, very poetic. Yes, the, the fiction is very poetic because that's the only way I can get my, my poetry published. It's just <laughs> deceiving, <laughs> deceiving readers into fakeness, disguised as, as, as this, is, this is a novel and really it's just a long poem. <laughs> so, perhaps that's possible. But, but one of the things that, that, that to me felt very, very striking was um, that all these characters, as you said, they carry these histories um, so they're very self-aware of, of of where their predicaments and where they lie. I think, as 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 I was saying, like Urayuan 
carries those predicaments and, and acts out on those predicaments in very graphic and disturbing ways in some ways. But we have protagonists like Mori Vivi, for example, who's a college-age student um, that goes to La UP. And as if anyone has ever been to La UP, it's, it's sort of a very, a very um, protest culture uh, university. Um, they're constantly shutting it down because the students will shut it down if there's something that's not, that's not working for them and functioning. And mostly, it's, it's been that condition since my mother went to school there. My mother went to school in La UP in the 70s, I think. Um, she's, she's a little older, but um, she went to school in the 70s, there, and that was a similar culture that was still carried uh, over. So um, going to LAUB, where, where I met my, my significant other <laughs> doing my master's, I, uh, <laughs> I, I was immersed in that culture. I was immersed in it, and so the political was, was inherent in everything that, that, that was at stake. And so I really felt a responsibility that to portray these things, but not to portray it in a way that <clears throat> that sort of has to explain, um, but a way that just feels organic to, to the voices that, that are carried throughout the book. Um, the, the author, uh, Viet Thanh Nguyen's The Sympathizer, he has this, the Twitter fame where he says um, um, that writers of color write as if you don't need to explain. And that, that's, I think that's a very fair advice to give to aspiring writers, especially writers from communities that are not represented widely in publishing is that you shouldn't feel that obligation to explain anymore. That, that, there's a long history of that, and the writers of color that, that were able to, to sort of somehow manage to publish, um, which was, it feels like a miracle sometimes um, when you look back, even though there's still such a disparity now in publishing, in major, like big five publishing or big four. Um, and and that, that advice I always pass on. It's like you, you, there isn't a necessity to explain immediately. I think after you go into the editorial process, you can sort of, ask yourself, what are the things that you feel are necessary to explain just for to contextualize, and what are things that you don't necessarily feel obligated to explain, and you just let the reader yeah. go off and do their research, right. as, as they should, as that's yes. the responsibility. I, I'm a big advocate of active reading. Yes. I tell my students this, and I don't think they like it, but I, <laughs> I, I, I tell them, like, I, I expect readers to be actively engaged in work. That's how I come to reading. I, I don't look for a passive experience. Um, and if I find myself in passive experiences and reading them often, sort of I get sidetracked, I get distracted. Um, and so I, I really emphasize that, mm -hmm. that those are the responsibilities that we, we can impose in our work. We don't have to. I mean, everyone has their own desires and what their accomplishments and what they want. Mm -hmm. um, but at least for me, the experiences of why I read or why I come to the page are often um, something, to be, something to be sparked by language or sparked by ideas and sparked by, by the political. But I'm not, I, it's interesting because I don't, I think this novel, I guess, is political, but I didn't, when I was writing it, I didn't feel it necessarily <clears throat> political. I was just so taken aback by the possibilities of dystopia, yeah. um, of this, 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 this hypothetical reality that in many ways um, was not uh, a fantasy. It was very real. Like, all, those, all those experiences, like people have always asked me, some of these things feel so real. It's like, because they were. Mm -hmm. Like, I didn't have to really imagine that far into, into, into speculation to see sort of um, the dangers of, of, of being in quarantine, of knowing that, that, that you could act out violence and no one would come and report it because you couldn't connect with, with the police. And so the police were stressed. And all these other, these other institutions sort of came into mind as to how to create a dystopia. Well, it was right there. It was right there for all the yeah. Puerto Ricans that lived back home for the months and months after um, the hurricane had passed. So uh, I guess it is political in that way. I don't think it's possible to write Puerto Rican literature that's not political. Yeah. <laughs> so, that's, that, that is so true. whether you want to or not. Um, so I, I don't know, how are you doing time? I mean, I have like a hundred questions. I can mm -hmm. stay here all night, I, so I don't I know. Cast a question. I, I do not know exactly, but somewhere, Callie, do we have some questions that have come in? Um, Should we open it up here? Let's open it and up. Does anybody have a question? Well, there's a question. Mm -hmm. um, so first of all, I want to thank you because as someone who like lives in Hurricane Maria, it was really meaningful to see that experience captured so authentically, and you know the voices of Puerto Ricans amplified in like such like a prominent level. So yeah, I just wanted to say it really means a lot. So thank you. Um, Thank you for reading. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so my question is, so at the end, Memoria, it, it burns. And this was something that started out as kind of like 
a utopia and an alternative to like a government that essentially is always letting Puerto Ricans down. Um, so did you mean for that burning to be sort of like this cautionary tale where any like society in Puerto Rico is kind of like doomed to fail? Or is it something like, you know, we can kind of be reborn again and continue to try and like create some sort of freedom on our island? Yes, thank you. That is that is a question that I think about often. Um, I I'd like to think that the the symbolism of of those events that occur in the novel are are everything that you've described. I think they're all of the above. I love giving these answers to, to people that ask. It's like these non-answers. That's, that's, that's my favorite. I'm, I'm a master at that. And so I would say that it's all of the above. But uh, to be fair to the question, I, I also think that um, we have to be careful as, as a nation when we think about reinvention. And I, I found it so beautiful, and I think many Puerto Ricans did in 20, 2019, the summer of 2019, we can't forget that, um, of the power of, of, of activism. The, of, of true activism when, when the population of Puerto Ricans came together and ousted the, the governor that was in, in, in position at the time. And that is something that is, feels unheard of and impossible at times. But, but I, I believe in that possibility. And those elections were very scary for a lot of the prominent political parties at the time. Because as the votes were being casted, even the mayor of San Juan at the time, um, these, there were a lot of votes that traditionally would go to the two powering structures, the, the, the statehood and the commonwealth parties or the dominant political parties back home. Um, they were being transitioned to a third alternative that wasn't even independence. It was just something else because people were fed up. People were, are exhausted. And I think it's a younger generation that is pretty exhausted with the politicking that my, gen my parents' generation, our, our parents' generation sort of feel. Um, uh, that you're sort of voting on party lines, and that's not that's not a, a unique situation. We do this here in the United States very clearly, <laughs> obviously. Um, but but in many ways, I, I thought that that moment was was a beautiful rendition of, of possibilities of what happens if we come together um, in a true way, an authentic way, where we demand that we no longer implement the same system, the same system of powers that are essentially just feeding into this very destructive cycle. Um, so I, I I like to think that. Though that symbolism of, of reimagining occurs only when we have to sit at the table with nothing and start again. Um, because you're always going to have an Urayuan character that could potentially come in and want to take advantage. And that's the history of the Caribbean, or the history of all colonial and post-colonial societies. So there's always an intervention, whether it's a foreign intervention that comes in and facilitates someone to try to be implemented in power, or um, someone that's local that feels a, a, a fissure that they can take advantage of. I think what I want carries that, and that, and he perhaps is in many ways an interesting figure and a complicated figure of, of that of those dualities in some ways. So, um, my non-answer is it could be all of the above. <laughs> yeah. Great question. Any other questions? Hmm? Uh, so, okay. so yeah, uh, first of all, as you know, I'm a Professor of Caribbean literature, and I'm married to a Puerto Rican, and I and in many ways I identify with Puerto Rico more than I even do my hometown. Mm -hmm. After you know having gone so many times and you know connected so strongly with the island, and I I would say first of all this is a phenomenal Puerto Rican novel. I mean it just it's it's you know many people will say this is this is a great debut novel, it's a great first novel, I and mean, this is a great novel. Period. First twentieth hundred. Uh, and, and one thing as a literature professor, I tell my students a lot, you know, don't, don't put too much importance in the, in the symbolism of people's names, you know, that don't, don't focus too much on that. But I, but I just have to ask about Mori Bibi, because on the one hand, I found her to be one of the most compelling characters, and I'm so happy that you read that passage from her. But, you know, there's this little plant in Puerto Rico that everybody knows about that's from there. And like the first few times I visited, everybody wanted to tell me what the Mori Bibi was. You know, you touch the plant and it closes its leaves and goes closer to the ground. And I just found that, I just couldn't stop thinking of that plant the whole time I'm reading this novel. I just wonder if you could say something about it. I mean, I, I really thought to me that that was one of the most striking symbols in the novel. Yeah, I, I love the Morevivi plant because growing up, they were everywhere in our backyard. And I am a big fan of not wearing shoes or sandals. And so <laughs> walking around in my yard growing up, um, the Morevivi plant has these little thorns on it. And you'd always get pricked. <laughs> and so I would often be getting pricked by this plant. But I, I like the, the, the possibility of a sensation of, 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 of a character that's named after a plant that is so resistant. That, that's a very resistant and resilient plant. I mean, it's a weed in some ways, I think. I'm not a 
a, a person that studies plants, but I, I, it's just so prevalent and it's everywhere. Um, and so I, that, that name was just always associated to me with childhood of thinking about um, trying to roam free, but being wary of what is, what is underneath your feet and only learning by getting pricked consistently. Um, but also seeing it, all right? it's, a, it's a green plant, but then when you touch it, it closes and it turns into like a violet and a purple, yeah. purple like hues when it's closed and dead. Um, so that we're not dead, it opens up again actually, so it's not dead. Um, but, but so that, that was kind of like the inspiration. I was just thinking of sort of the resilience of, of plants and, and, and thinking of that specific one and growing up in my childhood as, as essential. So yeah, I'm happy you brought the name up because it, it was, there was some thought that came into it, which was, I, I, like, I like the idea of that being re relatable in some ways. If I can follow up just briefly, I, I kept thinking, sorry, about that plant as being so low to the ground, and one of the very few things that would have not been destroyed, because the destruction of nature is something that I found absolutely unbearable yes. the first time we went back. Like, I mean, and I, and I don't want to exaggerate this because I'm not from there, I don't live there, but, but it was just, it's mind-boggling. Yeah, it took, I think it took a, uh, more than a year for it to look similar to how, to how it, it can be. Um, we, we went back, I, I was able to return to, to Nebraska as I had to, I mean, I was in school, and they somehow let me off the hook for a week or something. Um, good, good for them, <laughs> pat on the back. But um, we ended up going back for the holidays, as we, as we try to do, um, and it, this was just, what is it, four months removed from the mm -hmm. hurricane. And there was still, most of the islands still didn't have power. But the nature itself was, when it was reviving, uh, my mom used to say, it looks like the, the trees from the Lorax. Yeah. Like, that they were like little, uh, all the trees just had these little green bushes, but nothing was vibrant in, in, in its outpouring. So that was always an interesting thing to see how nature recovered mm -hmm. um, in, a, in a very gradual way. Eventually it does. I think that's the resilience of nature, um, that it does always recover. Yeah. Or we hope that it always recovers. Yeah. At one yeah. point it won't recover, and then we have to worry <laughs> extensively. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm curious to know what it means for you as a writer to be far away from Puerto Rico and if it's opened up um, ways of seeing that you don't have if you're in there all the time or if there's things that you feel um, you miss or lose or especially what kinds of imaginative lines of communication you, you, you keep open with there and how you keep your sensitive fresh. Well, maybe you don't want to keep it fresh. I do not follow this. Yes, I mean it's a, it's an important question. It's a question of diaspora. What happens when 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 you sort of find opportunities or or, or the history of Puerto Ricans is essentially diaspora, right? Um, Manuel Ramos Otero, I'm, I'm re, I was rereading um, Pagina en Blanco en Staccato, mm -hmm. where he takes it's a very very little short book. It doesn't have a translation, which a lot of work in Puerto Rico. We we need to do better with translating, um, just in general, just in general, and trying to have a culture that reads translated books. Um, but but he, he speaks of, of, of he tried to outline the, the history of, of Puerto Rican migrations in, in kind of like a non-fiction, non-fictitious way. Um, and it's, it's always glaring and interesting to see that these things were occurring in the 1900s when, when Puerto Ricans migrated to Hawaii and when they were moving then eventually with citizenship to the US. Um, to, to New York, of course, and so those populations grew. And now, more recently, we have a, a larger diaspora because of the hurricane, right? A lot of Puerto Ricans did not move to the conventional spots of New York, though some did. It was mostly Orlando. Like, Orlando is like little Puerto Rico. <laughs> the, the plane ride from Orlando to, to Puerto Rico is the bus, is what people <laughs> take frequently. And so, um, but this is a common thing that's happening across, uh, because of the advent that we're not we're not immigrants, but we are, because we're treated as immigrants in some ways, especially those who don't speak English. Mm -hmm. You're sort of casted as immigrant, but you're, you're moving. In many ways, you're just moving because you do still have technically citizenship. So the conversation of diaspora is something that, that a lot of uh, Puerto Ricans in my generation, younger Puerto Ricans that moved mostly because of educational purposes, wanting to pursue education in the States or getting scholarships or whatever, or finding access in that way, um, are now in that conversation, a question of what it means to be an immediate and new diaspora. Um, so it's, it's compelling, yes, I think I, I often think about home, especially in February. <laughs> this, is, this is the month where I most think about home, and I'm often daydreaming. Especially last about, week, right? Uh, yes, I mean, uh, as you pointed, the irony of the event being canceled because of a storm, for a, a book about a storm, um, is not lost on, on anyone that knows. So um, I'm, 
I'm aware of it, but I, but I think that the the things that I'm finding most interesting are the conversations that I'm having with Puerto Ricans in the diaspora. I have a close friend of mine who was who was born in in New York and is is essentially New Yorkian, if you if you want to use that term. And so we're having these long and elaborate conversations, sustained for years, about the the relationship between Puerto Ricans in the diaspora and the relationship of Puerto Ricans back home, and how it's a fraught relationship. It's always been a fraught relationship. Um, there, there's a sense of, of anger often that comes from Puerto Ricans back home from those that leave, even those that leave like me who leave, who, who were born and raised there, right? That, that, that all of a sudden we're cast in a different way. Um, so the history of that is very evident. Um, and so I'm, I'm mindful of it. And I, I, I like to think and I like to hope that we need to bridge those scars and heal them in its absoluteness to move forward. Because um, my, my, my good friend... Uh, she she's reading. She was reading and having these conversations about Langston Hughes and, and the conversations about 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 blackness in the 1920s when he was writing about a Negro on the Mountain, and how in some ways I feel and she she we sort of had this conversation a few days ago about um, what conversations are still happening in, in in the Puerto Rican communities and how can we move beyond that to try to find something different because we're still fighting with each other. There's still a lot of infighting in that. And so that's the most prominent, pro prominent thing that's happening now in my mind, is thinking of ways of which we can bridge those, those gaps and, and have more productive conversations between Puerto Ricans and diaspora. Because you can't, you can't have, you, you have to have the diaspora in the conversation, yeah. right? Um, in, in that book, Manuel Ramos Otero's book, he actually says, no, in, in an interview that he does, in a recent um, series of interviews that he has that they were collected, He's, he's basically saying, like, how do you not account for New York as an example? Because New York is essentially the biggest uh, town of Puerto Rico with the amount of Puerto Ricans that have uh, moved to New York City. But now Orlando will become the second or maybe the biggest one. That, so, so those conversations need to happen. And, and they need to happen in a way that, that feels um, that, that are geared towards love as opposed to an antagonism. That's what's on my mind. And it's been on my mind for the last like two months or so. So um, I'm glad you asked that. Are there any other questions? I have one more question. I have a question for the for the poet in you, and it's just a question of beauty. I mean, it seems like your your writing is just super beautiful, and it seems like it's also about noticing beauty. Um, you know, like even within the traumatic. Uh, Tableau that the passage that you read draws, they you know, beauty calls attention to itself and <coughs> beauty is some kind of form of attention that the brain is performing, <laughs> like even in the trauma. And I just wonder what you think about beauty. <laughs> the big question. <laughs> <laughs> the question that I think the fastest way of answering that is that um, I I am drawn towards writers that, that work through beauty in their fiction. Um, if I'm reading fiction, I, I'm often geared to writers like that, Edward Dantica, who carries a lot of beauty in her sentences. I think Toni Morrison is one of the most beautiful poetic uh, fiction writers that ever existed. Um, and she doesn't get enough of that. And interestingly enough, as, 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 as Toni Morrison scholars would know, that her first two books weren't, weren't received well because of language. She was actually attacked because it was, it was seething with anger and, 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 and all that in one of the New York Times reviews that, that they reviewed her for, for The Bluest Eye. Um, and so I'm very intrigued by that, that the, the possibilities of language being able to capture beauty, even though the scenes are graphic, even though the scenes are, are very, very much <coughs> difficult to process. That's, I think that's the entirety of Toni Morrison's work, <laughs> is that all the beauty in her words and the way she structures images and, and language are encompassed in, in, at the sentence level. And so I, I'm very much meticulous about that, at least with this book. I don't know what the other book will hold or, or how I will approach language in that way, but I did feel it an essential need to, to capture beauty because in a, in a situation that is otherwise not beautiful, that you can find beauty on the page with, with the words and with the images and how they're depicted in a respectful but in a very um, organic way. Since you mentioned the book you're working on now, uh, do you want to tell us a little bit about it? Because we cannot wait. <laughs> yeah, that, uh, that book was written and then it was scrapped. It's about two brothers and, and it's becoming more and more a book about um, how, how trauma is processed regarding suicide and mental health and how the youngest brother is trying to reclaim the spirit of, of the older brother that... <clears throat> that 
that attempts suicide, and I'm still not sure whether he actually follows through with it. Um, and so I think I think it might be epistolary. I'm still not sure I'm working that out because I have to revamp it completely. <laughs> like, like I had this interesting conversation with one of my friends about that book, how she's like, oh, it's, it's written, isn't it? It's like, yeah. It's like, so what's wrong with it? And I, I said, I think it needs a new plot. <laughs> like that, that small little thing, I think it needs a new plot. And with that being said, I said, oh, well, yeah, we're going to have to reimagine it in its, in its complete entirety. So. Um, we're thinking through it. I'm thinking through it. Okay. Any last questions before we close it up? Well, thank you everyone again. For being here. Thank you.